Coming up on Turning Point International. Here I am, a Christian woman. I hated this 16-year-old boy. And I never, ever thought I would be put back together. Hello and welcome to Turning Point International. As always, it's great to have you with us. If you haven't noticed already, we have a brand new set, new graphics, and a whole new look. We hope you like it as much as we do. We're going to kick off the program with what we like to call things your grandmother would say. We have one for you from West Africa, and it says, speak softly and carry a big stick. You'll go far. Great advice. I like it. Well, Kathy Edwards has some words of wisdom to share with you about finding your way along life's road, even when the path is bumpy. Take a look. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. It's easy to believe that God is ordering your steps when they take you down a smooth, easy path. But what about when your steps take you to rough places where the path is difficult, where each step is heartbreaking and painful. Are those steps ordered by the Lord? The book of Job talks about a righteous man, Job, who suffered a lot. He lost his children, they were all killed. He lost his property, he lost his health. All he had left was an angry wife who told him, you ought to curse God and die. But Job asked her a very good question. It's a question we must all ask. He asked, shall we only receive good from God and not receive evil as well? That's the kind of question that makes you say, hmm. Job was a good man before all of his troubles, and he was the same good man during those troubles. I guess what Job was saying to his wife was, we had no problems believing that God was ordering our steps when things were good. Now that things are bad, does that mean our steps all of a sudden aren't ordered by God? If you, like Job, fear God and have given your life to Him, then He is ordering your steps in good times and bad times. How do you know that you even have faith if it's never put to the test? How do you know that you'll remain faithful and true to God if nothing ever happens to make you question His goodness? How do you know that you'll obey God if you're never put in a situation where you don't want to obey Him? You won't know until you're tested. God-ordered steps will not bypass trouble. Doesn't Psalm 34, 19 say, many are the afflictions of the righteous? That means when God is ordering your steps, they may be full of trouble. But here's the good news. The second part of that verse, it says, but God delivers him out of them all. So you have to ask yourself what Job asked. Am I only going to serve God in the good times? Am I only going to remain faithful to Him when things are going my way? Job chose to serve God when he was blessed. He also chose to serve God when those blessings were taken away. If you can remain faithful to God and serve Him passionately when there seems to be no reason to, you are truly a servant of God and he will delight in your every step. Job's life shows us that if you bless God's heart, he will bless yours. I know it may be hard right now, but stay on the straight and narrow path and keep walking. Weeping endures for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Think about it. 
wise words from Kathy. And it's important to bless God in all seasons, both good and bad. And speaking of seasons, we always like to hear what is on the heart of our viewers. Simi Salal Kai is here with some of your Facebook comments and questions. Hey Simi, what do we have? Yes, we have a good one here. We have a question from Veronica. She's from Nakuru, Kenya, and she asks, how can someone sustain their salvation when faced by trials? What do you think? It's an interesting one. I've always felt, you know, it's not up to you to sustain your salvation because it's given to you by Christ. You just have to live in his grace. But I, I do wonder what you have to say, though, Sim. Throw it right back at you. Well, one of my favorite scriptures is John 16, 33, and it says, Jesus said, in this world you will face trouble, but mm -hmm. take heart. I have overcome the world. So I feel like trials come, mm -hmm. but he said we should take heart because he's going to help us overcome them. And that's exactly it. He has overcome it. So we should just take heart. Yes. Amen. Thank you. Well, if you have a question you would like us to answer, send it to us on Facebook at Turning Point Zone. Now, after the break, a man loved by millions faces the biggest battle of his life. It's not a question of how long will I be here. It's a question of what am I doing while I'm here. Welcome back to Turning Point. Now he's known as the Michael Jackson of the Christian music world. And Carmen has sold more than 10 million records and set the world record for the largest solo Christian concert in history. His work has inspired me to do what he's done as an artist. Now Simisola, you spoke to him recently and I hear it was a heart-wrenching conversation. Yes, it really was. Carmen and I talked about his life, his music, and a diagnosis that rocked his world. Take a look. Well, you were known all over the world by millions of fans as Carmen the Champion on stage, in your movies, in some of your CDs, uh, but yet now you're facing one of the biggest battles of your life, uh, being diagnosed with terminal cancer. So what is it that keeps that champion spirit alive in you? Well, I think, first of all, you know, when I did the song, The Champion, I sort of got associated with that word, mm -hmm. but in, in the song, Jesus is the Champion. So I, I never had to quite live up to that. <laughs> and, um, but, you know, when, when you start using words like champion or radically saved, addicted to Jesus, these type of phrases and words are associated with you, so you do have something to live up to. And uh, sometimes the, the, uh, the idealistic is, is difficult to live out in the real. Uh, and, but then every once in a while you get a challenge like what I got. And I was diagnosed on uh, actually Valentine's Day uh, with a, a multiple myeloma cancer. And uh, it, it causes your, your immune system to drop. And then you just start to catch it and everything that just runs around. So the, the, the challenge is uh, what does God want me to do with the time that I have here? Because most of the people that have affected our lives the most in life have spent the least amount of time on this planet. So it's not a question of how long will I be here, it's a question of what am I doing while I'm here. And that was, that's always been the most concern to me. So when I was diagnosed, I just had to look at my life and say, have I done enough with the amount of time that I have and is this my time to go? And if it's my time to go, then I'm ready to go. But obviously it didn't seem like the Lord was ready for me to check out so early. Mm. So it was more about the quality of time. Yeah, I think so. It's appointed for every man wants to die. But before that time, you know, if we live, we live for Christ. So what am I going to do? And how many people am I taking with me when I leave this planet? Amen. I want to talk a little, about, a little bit about the other side of cancer. Sure. Now, I know in your Facebook you posted a little bit about that, yeah. <laughs> um, how when you were diagnosed, it was kind of hard because the people closest to you were kind of treating it like it was like a contagious disease and what was that experience like? Yeah, everybody reacts differently 
you know. And uh, I was I was really serious with somebody. You know, we we're actually thinking about. Um, um, I was thinking about getting married. And when this happened, we had to have a long talk. And basically, she said that she didn't feel like she could be the person to to walk with me through that type of scenario. We hadn't we weren't we weren't really walking through anything yet, but the anticipation of it. And I think sometimes people, they look to the future. They say, am I going to have a, a happy future with this person? Or am I going to be a nurse? You know, when they start thinking like that, then, you know, probably it's, it's a way of weeding out who loves you and who doesn't. But it's a rough way of doing it. <laughs> it's brutal mm -hmm. because you don't see it coming. And I do have some family members, some even siblings that... Um, I don't even hear from, I haven't even gotten a text or a, a get well or a, a Facebook post from just to say, we're praying for you. Um, it's just strange. But then the, the other side is that the people that you don't even know send so much love. Like on Facebook, I had like one post got 18,000 comments. And then I looked at the message and there was like 11,000 messages. It's like, oh, I didn't even know that they were there. Mm -hmm. I didn't even know that they really cared. So. You know, you, you lose one thing over here and you get it somewhere else. So. So, so what is the good that is coming out of it with your music and your upcoming tour? Well, I never thought I would tour again. I thought I was it. I thought I was checking out. Um, I had a friend who I hadn't seen for 20 years called me up, I'm an attorney, and says, uh, hey, if there's anything I could do, just want to see how you're doing, how you're feeling. And then he said, look at all this love you have on Facebook. You should put out a record. I says, well, but record companies are not signing anybody right now. He says, well, let's do it ourselves. Let's go through Kickstarter. So we went to the Kickstarter program, and he put the whole thing together for me. He says, let's, re let's see if the people want the music from you. Let's see if the people, if they want music, then they're going to want to see you in concert. And if they want music and they want to see you in concert, God's got to keep you alive. Well, let's see what God has to say about the future and if he touches their hearts. We put it out there, and we still got, like, you know, another 15 days to go. And um, we're reaching our budget, and it's letting me know that he wants me to put another music, more music out there. And if I have music, then I have to tour it. So that means I must be getting better. I mean, or at least enough to tour, which I'm, I'm happy with. Amen. So God has great things in store for you. I'm planning on it, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so finally, just for someone watching who maybe is battling cancer or they know someone who's battling cancer, what is something you can say to them to keep them going, keep that hope alive? I think the most important thing is um, recognize that the quality of time you have here is really the most important thing. You know, just fighting and kicking and agonizing and dying a thousand deaths before we actually leave this planet is not the way God designed it. So for whatever time you do have, for whatever time God is allowing you to have here on this earth, is to be enjoyed and to be enjoyed with the people that you love the most and the ones that love you. And don't waste time trying to win people's hearts who really don't care. Um, and in, in, embrace what is before you. Don't embrace the fear of what might happen tomorrow. Embrace the joy of what is happening today. Amen. It's really quite sad, the news of Carmen having cancer, isn't it? Yes, it was. But you know, one thing I noticed about him, despite what he was going through, he had such a great sense of humor. You would never guess that he was facing something so difficult. Now, you think there are people um, around the world going through this who can take strength from the fact that in the face of adversity, he still saw a beat. Yeah. And you know, it just reminds me that, you know, with God, nothing is impossible. So I'm definitely rooting for his healing. Me too. When we come back, a woman's worst nightmare becomes a reality. It seems unnatural for a parent to have to bury their child.
If you would like to book Muiwa and River songs for concerts, ministry, and speaking engagements, just call the number on your screen or go to riversongs.com. Welcome back. The woman in our next story was a joyful mother who had hopes and dreams for her son's future. Yet her world was turned upside down the day she received news no parent ever wants to hear. Take a look. That was it. The right man's gone. I've never seen him graduate. Never see him married, you know, him have children. It seems unnatural for a parent to have to bury their child. On February 12th, 1993, Mary Johnson's only son, Loramian, was killed by four gunshots in a gang-related altercation. With the help of eyewitnesses, detectives found their prime suspect two days later. I think hatred began to set in just right then. During a police investigation, 16-year-old O'Shea Israel confessed to killing Loramian. After two years of hearings and appeals, he was tried as an adult and convicted of second-degree murder. Mary addressed him during her impact statement in court. I said, you know what? If my son had taken your life, I would expect him to have to pay the cost. And then I ended up telling him that I forgave him. The word says, in order to be forgiven, you must forgive. So I said, well, OK, I had to tell him. But I wanted him locked up, caged, because he was an animal. And that's what he deserved. O'Shea was sentenced to 25 years in prison. The grieving process for me, I think it began um, after the trial, wave after wave after wave after wave, the tsunami just stuff, you know, hatred. Here I am, a Christian woman. I hated this 16-year-old boy. And I never, ever thought I would be put back together. After the trial, Mary went through the motions of life. She visited friends and stayed active in her church. But it would be 10 long years before her emotional turmoil would end. In 2004, her pastor asked her to teach a class on forgiveness. As she studied the class book, Mary says she took a hard look at her heart. I'm hearing, Mary, you need to repent. You need to repent for all these things that you've said about this young man, all these feelings that you've had for him. And I'm like, it's, I have right to have those feelings for him. Then I heard Mary, Pray for him like you pray for yourself. And I'm like, I'm praying for him. OK, so I pray for him like I pray for myself. And um, then I heard, every time his name comes up, every time you hear it within yourself, say, I choose to forgive. So I repented. And I really believe it was a true Repentance. It was for real. It was for real. As Mary started to change, so did the person she was praying for. I, I started coming into myself, started maturing, and with maturity, I decided I wanted to hold myself accountable and be responsible for my actions. In 2005, Mary took another courageous step toward healing. She contacted the Department of Corrections and requested a face-to-face -face meeting with O'Shea. I have to make sure I have truly forgiven him. I don't have all the hatred. I can honestly say that from the moment I walked into the room, the energy level was like peaceful. We had a, a conversation and, and you know, he admitted what he had done. He told me that, you know, if he could have communicated that night, um, things would have been different. And she asked a lot of questions about myself and my life and it showed that she was interested in getting to know the person. And I told him, I said, look, I told you in court that I forgave you. But today, from the bottom of my heart, I want you to know that uh, I forgive you. And he was like, ma'am, how can you do that? 
And I said, because of who is within me. It was a very powerful and moving meeting, but I felt like extremely compelled to just ask her, may I give you a hug to show her my genuineness. I do remember falling and he was holding me. He had to hold me up until I felt this thing leave me. And I instantly knew that all that hatred, all the bitterness, the animosity, all that junk I had inside me for 12 years, I knew it was over with. It was done, it was instantly, it was gone. Mary and O'Shea continued to meet and they eventually began speaking in prisons about forgiveness and reconciliation. The more and more we spoke, the more and more our bond started to grow. And Mary has turned into one of my biggest supporters. She worries about me when I'm not worried about myself. And that's something that a mother does. O'Shea was released from prison in 2010, and Mary arranged his homecoming party. I walked in and I saw all these people that I didn't know who only know of me because of the pain and the hurt I've caused. But I walk in and get hugs. I walk in and get smiles. That's another part of the forgiveness, like the community forgave me. Um, her friends were able to forgive me. Today, O'Shea and Mary are next door neighbors. They speak all over the country about the power of forgiveness. I am so grateful for who I am today in God and that I'm not that person that I used to be full of all that junk. Being on the other side of forgiveness is important in my life because it made me free enough to be myself. I, I can really live and enjoy life. I can enjoy people. I can enjoy being home. I can enjoy laughing. Outside of that, I got a huge family now. <laughs> you know, unforgiveness is a dangerous thing. And I tell you, when you allow the Holy Spirit to release you, oh my God, what freedom. What freedom there is. You'll be amazed at where you'll be at in your life. Now you might be wondering, how can a woman forgive a man that killed her only son? How is this possible? Maybe you have bitterness or some animosity or you're holding a grudge against someone. They might have hurt you or you have every reason to be bitter. You can set yourself free today by forgiving them. I promise you if you let it all go, the sleepless nights you have, the anger you feel, the pain you carry, it would all go away. But you need God to help you with that. And the first step on that journey to God helping you is a prayer where you just tell God how you feel and he responds to your cry. So let's pray together. God, I come to you today, having watched what I've just seen and realizing that it's possible for me to let go of the pain I carry. It's eaten away at me in my heart, in my mind, and I just need some peace. Lord Jesus, come into my life and Help me forgive. Help me accept your forgiveness so I can forgive others. Set me free now from the pain and the resentment I carry. I ask you today, amen. If you prayed with me, love to hear from you. During the break, you'll find out how you can contact us. Now, after the break, we have a brand new segment that will leave you in stitches.
Welcome back. The Bible tells us that laughter is good for the soul. So we have a new segment called Muiwa's LOL Moments, Laugh Out Loud Moments. Here's something funny that would have you rolling on the floor, I guarantee you. You think you have moves, you don't have anything on the African dancer in this video. <laughs> Now, here's something else for your soul. We'll leave you today with Tamala Mann singing, Take Me to the King. From all of us here at Turning Point, goodbye and God bless you. Truth is I'm tired. Options are few. I'm trying to pray. But where are you? I'm all churched out, hurt and abused. I can't face what's left to do. Take me to the king. I don't have much to bring. My heart's torn in pieces. It's my own. To stop playing these games We need a word For the people's pain So Lord, speak right now Let it fall like rain Oh yeah, we're desperate We're chasing now Aha!